But if you turn in your Bibles, if you have them, to Matthew 5, we'll be looking at verses 13 through 16 in a very famous uh, passage there. If you're just joining us or visiting, then this is a great time to be here and to be visiting. We are, as a church, reminding ourselves of what some of our core values are. Last week, we, we looked at the core value of mission. As a church, we believe that we were created to serve the mission of God. And we are going to continue looking at that value this week, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. This is God's word. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown down and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father, who is in heaven. Thus far God's word. Let me pray for us. Lord, shine the light of your gospel truth into our hearts. Expose things that need to be exposed, that we might bring them to you and bring your healing light, your healing light, that we might look more like our Savior. We ask it in his name. Amen. Well, last week, we were looking at that very famous uh, and important verse in Jeremiah 29, where God says to his people who are off in exile in Babylon, seek the flourishing of the city. Seek the flourishing of the city where I have sent you, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its flourishing you will find your flourishing. Seek the flourishing of the city. You seek their flourishing, because that's how you're going to find your flourishing. In other words, we, we learn that God cares that his people actually seek to make the city a better place. That people within the city actually, the places where they live in their cities and their towns and their places, that those places flourish. But I have to admit that, that you know, the question that I think comes up is, I mean, can the church really make an impact? Just consider the way that we do announcements sometimes. Here are some announcements from some churches. One announcement says this, uh, don't let worry kill you off. Let the church help. Another announcement says, the Weight Watchers group will meet at 7 p.m. Please use the large double doors at the side entrance. Another, the 8th graders will be presenting Shakespeare's Hamlet in the church basement on Friday at 7 p.m. The congregation is invited to attend this tragedy. <laughs> at the evening service tonight, the sermon topic will be, What is Hell? Come early and listen to our choir practice. <laughs> Barbara remains in the hospital and needs blood donors for more transfusions. She is also having trouble sleeping and requests tapes of Pastor Nelson's sermons. <laughs> I was actually told once that someone said to me, I think they were trying to compliment me, they said, I listen to your sermons as I fall asleep. I thought, thanks. <laughs> and one time I was in England and I was announcing a hymn and it was, oh what matchless, and then I said, condensation. Everybody was like, what? And so then I read it again, and I said, oh, what matchless condensation, instead of condescension. And we can't even announce songs right. We can't even do our announcements right. What kind of impact can the church really make? And, and yet, it's to people like us, a group of disciples that Jesus calls up and he says, this is who you are. That Jesus says, you are, verse 13, the salt of the earth. Verse 14, you, you, even you are the light of the world. A group that included Judas. A group that included Peter. Not mature post-Pentecost Peter, like early Peter. He said, you, even you, 
You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And, and notice that he doesn't say um, you will be the salt of the earth and the light of the world when you get your act together. He doesn't say be the salt of the earth. You need to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. No, it's, it's not a command. It's a declaration. You are presently now the salt of the earth and the light of the world. It's amazing that he would call us that. So that's what we're going to look at today. What, what is the significance of being salt and light? What, what are the difficulties of being salt and light in the world? And where do we get the power to be salt and light? That's where we're going this morning. So first, the significance of being salt and light. Well, first, let's take the significance of salt. Well, just think what salt does. One of the things that it does is it seasons now, I realize that you don't relate to this very well because you're all healthy Californians. I go to a Mexican restaurant here, and I can't even get salt on my chips. What's going on? How do you eat chips without salt? And then I have to put them on later after the grease is dried. What's up with that? I go to picnics, and they have watermelon sitting out, and there's no salt. How can you eat watermelon without salt, people? And then someone tells me, oh, well, the watermelon's so good that you don't need salt. And I go, no, it, it needs salt precisely because it's so good, because salt brings out the goodness and the flavors. That's what salt does. You see, we don't have this health-conscious problem in the South where I'm from. We put salt on everything, cantaloupe, watermelon, chicken, vegetables, your fingers, just in case you missed anything, because salt brings out and enhances flavors, even caramel. Who would have thought? And when Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, at least one thing that he's saying is this. One implication is that you, you, the community, the people of God, you, you bring out and you enhance the flavor of society. Salt enhances. Salt uh, is a seasoning. Salt is also a preservative. It preserves and purifies. Now, unless you're Norwegian and eat lots of fish that have been cured in salt, then you normally don't use salt as a preservative. But in a world without refrigerators, salt preserves. Preserves meat, preserves fish. If you wanted to keep it for a while. Of course, in the ancient world, they didn't usually want to keep it for a while, right? Anytime in the Bible you see someone catch fish, they eat it immediately. Or they kill a calf, they eat it immediately. Nevertheless, in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, we see this strange thing. When they have these covenant ceremonies... Uh, and when they're sacrificing, um, have covenant sacrifices, they sprinkle salt on there. That's interesting. Why did they do that? Because they saw that salt is a preservative, and that was symbolic to say this, this covenant is to be a preserving thing. A and in the same way, Christians in society are to preserve society. You see, society, it's under the second law of thermodynamics as well. And we come in and we... we we slow that process. We slow that process. And, and here's, here's, what it, here's what it looks like. It looks like two of our, my family friends growing up boarding students from countries that have been war-torn. One student from Albania, another family taking in students from a war-torn country in Africa, and they brought them into their home and they gave them a home, and they sent them to a nice school, and they ensured that they went to college. And then when there were college breaks and Thanksgiving and Christmas and over the summer, they made sure that they had jobs and a place to stay. Salt. That's what it looks like. It looks like, it looks like two, it looks like Christians in, in Athens or in, Athens, Georgia, or Memphis, Tennessee, who recognized that the difficulty of education and educational standards in the inner cities in which they live. Did you know that one in three students, one in three students who do their education in the inner city, that one in three will graduate, and that is regardless of how hard they work? And they saw this, and they saw this disparity, and they said, something needs to be done. So they started schools. They started the downtown academy in Athens, Georgia, or they started the neighborhood school in Memphis, Tennessee, where students are given a quality education for a fraction of the cost 
In Memphis, they pay somewhere around $100 to $200 a year of the six or so thousand that it costs to actually send a student through there. In Athens, they're given a scholarship up to 90% so that these students can get quality education and even have boarding for those who need in some of the most impoverished places and the most impoverished counties in America. It looks like William Wilberforce and the abolition of the slave trade. It looks like Desmond Tutu and the abolition or the ending of apartheid. That's what it looks like. Salt. Salt. Salt seasons, salt preserves, but salt also fertilizes. Did you know that? As late as the 1800s, people saw salt as a fertilizer. Uh, Horace Greeley, he said, if I have, as in the late 1800s, if I have five bushels of salt, I'm sorry, he's, if five bushels of salt be applied to a field and it does not thereupon yield five bushels more per acre of corn, I will eat the field. I wonder if anybody took him up on that bet. I bet that was a salty field he ate. But seriously, even in Jesus' day, though, salt was seen as a fertilizer. This is why in Luke 14, you can turn there later, but in Luke 14, 34 and 35, Jesus says, Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is, no u- it is of no use either for the soil or the manure pile. Now, how many of you use salt for soil or manure piles? Uh, well, we don't do that. But in Jesus' day... Salt was thought to be a fertilizer. And so he's basically saying, uh, just as you think salt fertilizes the ground, uh, just as they would use um, in the in manure, so you Christians in society are to be a catalyst, an active agent, which promotes growth and flourishing. You see, Jesus' plan for us is not simply to stay the decay like a preservative, not just simply on the defensive, not just reactionary, but offensive, but active, but aggressive, moving out into society to promote, to stimulate growth, economic growth, cultural and artistic growth, technological growth, educational growth. That's what Christians are called to be. That's who they are. That's who they are. Lately, um, my wife and I have found that uh, the detergent just isn't doing its job quite the same way it used to. It could have something to do with, I don't know, a two-foot-tall little girl who has come into our house over the last year and a half, and it's like everything she touches stains. You can't, I mean, you might as well burn the clothes after she wears them once, and she seems pretty clean. I'm like, how does this happen? So we're trying to get the up the detergent. We're trying to get the stains out, and so we got this thing called borax. You know what borax is? So borax is this detergent booster. It boosts your detergent so that it actually works better. And you know what? It's actually a salt. It's a type of salt. And it goes into the washing machine, and it makes the detergent work better. Christians are like borax. They are they are a stimulus in the society. And here's what it looks like. It looks like, it looks like a, a company, an automotive company in the southeast who said, they started rethinking economics and rethinking even the way capitalism works out. And they said, you know what? Instead of viewing our, instead of basing our business simply on the idea of contract, of an exchange of goods for services, we're going to ask the question, we're going to ask the overarching question, what would it be like to to view our company in terms of covenant? And then they just ask this simple question, what responsibilities do we have to our customers and to our employees? And they noticed, as they started to ask this question, they noticed that margins in the inner cities where people are usually less educated and uh, less well off, that margins were strikingly higher at car dealerships. Do you know that? Than in the suburbs where folks were more educated and white collar. And they saw this, and they saw this disparity, and they said, we're not going to do this. So they set their profit margins in the inner city to be lower than the suburbs. And you know what? They ended up, the volume of their sales increased so much that they ended up outselling all their competitors salt. And then they looked at their employees and they said, well, 
we notice that the chances for low-wage earners and the chances for their kids, especially if they go to college and things like that, are, are so much worse than our management. And so they created a scholarship fund for their low-wage earners so that their kids could go to college. And they send their kids to college. And it, it's costly, it is, but you know what? They, they get loyalty. They get people who love to do their job. Salt. Salt is a gallery in northeast D.C. who n- realize that the people with the most need in the world are also the people with the most need for beauty. And so they commissioned 30 artists, 30 artists to, to paint scenes and sculpt scenes based on the Anacostia, I think that's how you pronounce it, area of D.C., one of the most um, impoverished and socially stigmatized areas. And they put these, uh, these uh, sculptures and paintings along the streets so that people could see the beauty and then at, of the streets of Anacostia. And then after that, they put them in Union Station. And the city officials said that it was the most viewed exhibit that they had ever had. And what happened was that beauty and history and the humanness of those people who had long been forgotten was honored and celebrated. Salt. Salt. It it looks like a grocery store checker who had the job for years, whose sphere of influence was a six by six foot space, and who made it her point to greet everyone with a smile, to be actually uh, interested in their lives, to remember her customers' names. And every time they walked away, she said, I will pray for your family, and she did. The store had this problem. Her lines were substantially longer than all the other lines. People would rather wait 40 minutes to be checked out by her than go through the express checkout. And at her funeral, it was standing room only. Salt. Salt. That's what Jesus says the Christian community is. Well, if that's salt, what about light? What is the significance of light? Well, this is a very potent and rich image light. It goes back to the first pages of Scripture. The first thing that God does in the beginning was God. And the first thing that God does is he says, let there be light, and there was light. And from there forward, light comes to represent the presence and the activity of God. This is why, uh, this is why actually that our, our forefathers in the Christian faith would think it's so odd that we meet in these worship spaces that are all dark because they would say, that means God's not there, symbolically, right? Uh, because light came to represent God, pr- the presence of God. Think about it. At the end of the Bible, the book of Revelation, there's no need for a sun. Why? Because the Lord is its light and sun. And then God calls his people Israel, and he calls them to be a, the light to the world. We read about that. And we see that all throughout Scripture, all throughout places like Isaiah, they were to be the light of the world. Israel was to be, Jerusalem was to be a city set on a hill. And the world, the nations were supposed to flock there like moths to a lamppost. But Israel, they hid their light. They didn't do do so good at this calling. And rather than bearing the light to the world, as N.T. Wright says, she surrounded herself with mirrors to keep the light in, while insisting that the nations must remain in darkness. And they did. And the world was dark. The people dwelt in deep darkness, Isaiah says. Until this man named Jesus comes. And he comes on the scene and he says, I am the light of the world. And his his life was the light of men. And the light that shone in the darkness through him, well, the darkness could not overcome it. And then he calls his disciples up onto this mountain to teach them about who they are to be. And he says, you are the light of the world. That that is the very vocation and calling of Israel I am giving to you. You are the new Jerusalem set on a hill. 
to be a light to the nations. See, in himself, Jesus took on the mission of Israel, and he has given that to his followers. We are the light of the world. And what does the light do? Well, we look at the mission of Israel, we look at the mission of Jesus, and we see that the light primarily does two things. The first thing that the light does is it exposes. John 3, 20, For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. I was at a concert this week. I was waiting for um, the band that I wanted to see, uh, hometown favorite, Lucero. As I'm waiting for, for Lucero to play, there's an opener, and uh, as I'm looking around, he must have been local. Everyone's singing the words, and I asked, is this a local guy? They said, yes. And, uh, and then he's coming to his last song, and he begins to introduce it, and he says, I- I'm an atheist, but I did write one worship song. I thought, that's interesting. So then he goes, and he starts singing this worship song, and this, these are the lyrics. Hallelujah, I ain't young, but I ain't dead yet. I got more promise than regret, so I sing hallelujah. But as a prayer to song and drinking, and all the things that ever made me feel alive. I have to tell you, I was sitting there looking around, watching these people, and I thought, I I had to fight back the tears, because I was just thinking, you don't know what life is. You don't know what it means to be alive. In fact, everything that you're doing right now is an attempt to numb yourself so that you don't feel alive. And the Christian community comes, comes into that. And just by our very presence, just by living amongst people, we show, we expose the thing that they're calling life for what it is, death. We expose. But not simply expose, we also, the light also illuminates. You don't just expose to expose, but you illuminate, you expose to show the way to salvation. You see, we are the people through whom the very presence and activity of God is shown forth. It is in our community that God's presence and activity is known to the world. Secular humanist at that time, Malcolm Muggridge, who was also a journalist, he visited India, and while he was in India, he comes to this place called Calcutta, and as he's in this place called Calcutta, he runs across this leprosorium, and in this leprosorium, there's this, this woman, you might not have heard of her, her name is Mother Teresa, and that was a joke, and Mother Teresa is there, she's serving lepers, and this is what Malcolm Muggridge says, he says, you know, secular humanist, They don't run leprosoriums. And he became a Christian. Christian community shows what life is like. They show that there's another way to be human. They show that there is a way to salvation with their lives. And Mother Teresa showed that in the community there to Malcolm Muggeridge. But what about us? Can we really have that impact? I mean, can we really have that impact here in Santa Barbara? And come on. Sometimes I do these things and I think, well, it's like, it's like a, a drop in a bucket. It is, it's like paying a mortgage. Like, that thing's not going down. I mean, what, what good is it? Can we really do any good? What about us? But notice that Jesus says there, verse 14, a city set on a hill cannot be hidden. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. You are the light of the world. You are a city set on a hill, and it cannot be hidden. You will be effective. You are effective. This is a declaration. This isn't something that you buck up and do. This is a declaration. You are the light of the world. You will be effective. But I don't feel effective. Do you feel effective? I don't often feel like salt. And light, I mean, if we were really salt and light, then it should mean that the people around us, our friends and neighbors, the community here, should look at us and say, man, we don't necessarily agree with you, but we know that our community is better because of you. And if you were to pack up and leave, we would be at a loss. You think people say that about us? I'm not sure they do. Well, why? Well, maybe that that takes us to our second point the difficulty of being salt and light. So we've looked at the significance of salt and light, but what about the difficulty of being salt and light? 
And to understand this, you need to, you need to understand the context here. Jesus has brought his disciples up on this mountain, and in verse 1, he's called his disciples to himself to teach them, and he's teaching them about what the community of Jesus is supposed to look like and be. And he starts with these things called the Beatitudes. They're these counterintuitive, upside-down characteristics of disciples of Jesus. And he gets to the end of those, and he starts talking about this thing called persecution. He closes by saying, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. See, what Jesus is saying is, when my disciples, when my disciples live in this counterintuitive way, there will be conflict with the society around them. They will be ostracized, they will feel out of step, and they may even face persecution. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really like persecution. I don't like to be ostracized. I don't even like to feel not included or out of step. How many of us do? So in that situation, the question is, what does the church do? And most often, the church is faced with two options that they, that they do. Because we don't like that, we try to mitigate the conflict, and we do that in one of two ways. We talked about it last week. The first way is that we either assimilate into the culture, downplay our distinctions, and that way there's less friction, or we separate from the culture. We isolate ourselves to decrease the friction. And in this text, Jesus, he, he warns us about both of these and not to do them. He warns us against uh, about not assimilating into society. Look in ver- our, our, yeah, assimilating into society. Look at verse 13. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is, good, it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown down and trampled under people's feet. You see, one temptation that we have as the church is we want to lessen our distinctions to say, well, we're really not that different, so there isn't really a conflict here. See, like a chameleon that changes colors to blend in protectively with its environment, we're tempted to play down or even abandon beliefs and practices that are difficult for society to accept. I mean, just think about it. Uh, It's a lot easier in our day and time to talk about a Christian vision for hospitality and social justice because those things are warmly pretty much accepted in our society, but to talk about a biblical vision of sexuality or the fact that Jesus is the only way to God, well, those things, those things are not so accepted. And we're tempted to say, well, Jesus isn't really the only way to God, or we're tempted to say, well, actually, you know, what the Bible says about human sexuality, oh, that's kind of archaic, so we can broaden it, but We think that we'll lessen somehow the friction, and that will lessen the friction. But when we lessen the friction, what else happens is this. We lose any power to make a contribution. What good is salt that's lost its saltiness? It's good for nothing but being thrown down on the ground and trampled under feet. You see, if we look just like the world, then we have nothing to contribute to the world to actually bring change. So you have to remain distinct. See, when churches look just like the world, why would anyone be attracted to them? When divorce rates in churches are the same as divorce rates outside, when we, when we basically what we try to offer people is the same entertainment that they can get outside, they come in and they say, okay, we do this and we do it better. Why would I go to church? People go to church because they offer something unique, something different, a message that says God loves you regardless of what you've done. God loves you and accepts you because of Jesus Christ. God loves you, and it's not based on your goodness. It's the gospel. But, but when, when, when we look just like everyone else, then we lose all power to make a contribution. So don't assimilate. Be distinct. Be salt. But that's one temptation, to look like a chameleon. But the other temptation is to assimilate into society. The other equal and opposite temptation is to retreat from society. And Jesus addresses this in verse 15 where he says that 
It doesn't really make any sense for someone to light a lamp and put it under a basket. If you're going to light a lamp in the middle of the house to show to light in the house, it doesn't make sense to light that lamp and then put it under a basket to hide the light. And he says that because he knows that we're tempted to hide the light. You see, just as uh, on the one hand we are tempted to look like chameleons and blend into society to protect ourselves, on the other hand, we are tempted to look like a musk ox. Do you know what a musk oxen is? Musk oxen, musk oxen are these animals that live in the Arctic plains in places like Canada. And because they're on the Arctic plains, they're very um, susceptible to being attacked by predators. And so if one's sick or one of their young is sick, then what they do is they, they huddle around that young and then they stick their horns out. And the Christian community often looks a lot like musk ox. Except it's seven, instead of having our horns stuck out, we kind of put our horns in and stick our bums out and just kick, right? Uh, retreat away, be a muck socks, get, uh, seclude yourself, and we retreat into, we tribalize into our Christian ghettos and our Christian subcultures to try to be safe. We try to protect our distinctions that way. And it's so subtle, but, but here's what it looks like. It looks like tribal dialects. You know, you can exclude people very easily by just speaking a certain language. And Christians speak a certain language, and they don't even realize it often, but it's a language that promotes exclusion from others. We, we tribalize in a, with a tribal dialect. We tribalize with tribal education. We tribalize with tribal music. We listen to Christian music. We tribalize with tribal coffee shops. Start Christian coffee shops where only Christians go. We tribalize by filling up our schedules with tribal activities. We have four or five Christian meetings a week. We go to two or three small groups. And, and we don't know other people. It, it's a subtle, sophisticated form of isolation. The, uh, there's a new study out by Gordon Conwell, a study for the... Uh, Center for the Study of Global Christianity, and it said that one in five non-Christians in North America does not know a Christian. One in five Christians in, Nor in North America does not know a Christian. 20%. 11 million people the size of L.A. said that they had no personal relationships with Christians at all. You think, how could that be? Because we filled up our schedule spending time and isolating ourselves with Christians that we don't know any non-Christians. Or if we do, we don't actually know them. We know of them. But we don't actually interact. And Jesus warns against this. He says, you need to stay distinct, be salt, but you also don't need to hide. Be light. And don't hide your light under a basket. See, these are two apparently safer ways to live. Two apparently safer ways. And they are safer to a certain degree. They are safer. Because you know where the most, the second dangerous, well, maybe they're not safer. They're not safer. They're not safe, but they're not safer. Uh, you know where the second most dangerous place in the world to be is, right? Inside the will of God a dangerous place to be salt and light. Because you know where the most dangerous place in the world to be is? Outside of the will of God. It appears safer, but it's not safer. Because Jesus says here that when the salt loses its saltiness, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is thrown down and trampled underfoot. You lose your identity, you lose your vocation, you lose your mission, you lose any potential. And that's a dangerous place to be because then you lose God. When we retreat, we lose God. When we assimilate, we lose God. So we have to be distinct and engaged. That's the calling. But it's hard. So where do we get the power to resist these temptations? Where do we get the power? That's our last point, the power. We looked at the significance. We've looked at the difficulties. But where do we get the power? 
Well, it's right there at the end of verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Give glory to your Father. Where do you get the power? You get the power in the fact that you are related to God and He is your Father. He is your Father. And that totally changes the way that we view this. It it means that we can, it has a powerful impact on the way that we view ourselves. You see, why does Jesus call us salt and why does he call us light? He calls us light because our Father is the Father of lights and therefore we are children of light, 1 Thessalonians 5, 5. We are distinct. We are a holy people because our Father's name is holy. This is why we are salt and light. It's not something that comes from in ourselves. It's not something that we muster up. It's a declaration, a declaration that does something. You know, when God speaks, it does something. When he calls us salt and he calls us light, it actually transforms us into that. Hey, some of us, uh, have, you, um, have you seen those kids' flashlights that you, maybe they're not just kids' flashlights, but they have a crank on them and you kind of crank it up. And as you crank it, the light goes and you wind it up really fast. And the harder you wind it, the more the light goes and the more power it has. You know what I'm talking about, right? And uh, I think some of us, like, we view the Christian mission and life that way. Uh, it's if we're not cranking a, we're not cranking a flashlight. We're on a giant treadmill that's, like, hooked up to the flashlight. And we're, like, going for all our life, worried that we're going to fall face down and fall off the thing. And for some of us, that's the best thing that could happen. I need that to happen to me. Because right now, I'm cranking the thing. I'm cranking the thing. Because I don't realize it. No, God's my Father. And it's by relating to Him that the light shows. That the, it's by relating to Him that I reflect His light. We're not, we're not little flashlights. We're mirrors. As the moon reflects the light of the sun, so we reflect the light of our Father simply by relating to Him, knowing Him as Father. That's what made Israel distinct. Israel's distinction was this, that they know the living God over and over again. This is why it's going to attract people to you. And they're going to say, why do you have such wonderful laws? And your societies run so well. And how are these things the case? And then they're going to know that your God is the true God. Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 26. It's through relating to God. It has a powerful impact. And when we do that, when we reflect our beautiful Father, they will see. They will see our beautiful works. And they will give glory to our Father who is in heaven. It changes the way that we view ourselves and our light. It also has an impact on the way we view our God. Verse 16 again says, Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your boss who is in heaven. Wait, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say boss, does he? No, he says father. Over and over and over again in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is calling God father and reminding his disciples that this is your father. Why? Because most often we're tempted to relate to him some other way. I know in my life it's like a boss. It's the new football season is starting back up and We are all, by we are all, I mean me, and you should be, excited to see what's going to happen with Colin Kaepernick playing a full season at San Francisco. If you don't know the backstory, basically what happened is last year, Alex Smith, the lead quarterback for San Francisco, got hurt. He was benched during that time. The second string, Colin Kaepernick, came out. He played a couple of games. Then Alex Smith recovered. Alex Smith was supposed to go back out and start again. He didn't. And then there was this kind of tension, and all these analysts were talking about it, and was Jim Harbaugh the coach? Was he doing the right thing? And, and at the end of the discussions, they were like, well, he does. He's doing the right thing because Kaepern- uh, Kaepernick's a better player. He's going to take him further. And then they just said, basically, it stinks for Alex Smith, but at the end of the day, business is business, and it's just business. And sometimes I think that that's the way we think about the mission of God. Business is business, and it's just business. And if I don't keep up on the treadmill, he's going to cut me. I'm going to be. I'm going to go from first string to second, and that's how. That's just how it's going to be. Because at the end of the day, it's just business. At the end of the day, it's not just business. At the end of the day, it's family. 
at the end of the day, you have a loving father who has moved out towards you in one way love and sent his son to love you and to give himself up for you. And it's when we root ourselves in that, that we are totally loved and totally accepted by a God who shines his light on us. It's when he, we do that, that we are able to resist this temptation because we know that that same father will protect us and be with us as we go out into the world in this distinct way. The, the famous speech by Martin Luther King on the mall in D.C. is important for a number of reasons. But in that speech, you know, all these people have crowded to the mall in D.C. and they're sitting there and they're listening to him. And it's interesting because the first part of that speech, he's actually, uh, he's actually just reading the script. And then at some point, somebody kind of yells out and it's like, you know, Talk about the dream. And about a minute later, King kind of lifts up and he totally like leaves his script. And then the most, all the most like important parts of that speech that you know, the most popular parts, like that's just him and his scripture saturated mind talking. And, and as he's talking, he's talking about this, this idea that, that we are all, that the people who are there, that we are all children of God and and children of the Constitution. And because of that, that, that you need to live that out. And he gets to that end of that speech and he says, go back to Mississippi, go back to Alabama, go back to South Carolina, go back to Georgia, go back to Louisiana, back to the slums and the ghettos of our northern cities, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed. And I want, I want you to picture them. Can you see them in their suits and their hats and their bags? walking back to their buses, boarding their planes, getting in their cars, and going back to those places. You know what they were doing? They were going to live out that declaration. They were going to live out that dream. They were going to live out the blueprint that he had given them. And Jesus here, he gives us a declaration. You are the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. So get out there. Get out there into your jobs and your workplaces. Get out there into your families. Get out there into your neighborhoods. Get out there into your gyms. Get out there into your coffee shops. Get out there to the bars. Get out there to the medical communities. Get out there to City Hall. Get out there and make an impact. You are the salt of the earth. Let me pray. Lord, I do pray that we would live out this vision. And I thank you that your word is powerful. Help us, good Father, to believe it. Help us to believe it. And to live it. For Jesus' sake. Amen.